Wonderful. Well, it's a, it's a real pleasure to, to be here with you all. Uh, we've heard some really inspiring, I think, uh, comments from the Secretary of State this morning about the commitment of the government to, to kind of getting behind an agroecological, a more regenerative uh, farming future, which is great. Uh, and he alluded to the public money uh, that might be available to help farmers make that transition. And what we're going to look at in this session is whether there might be some private money, uh, some natural capital that farmers might be able to tap into uh, to help ease this transition and make doing the right thing for climate and nature also the right thing for your, for your bank balance. Um, I've got a brilliant panel here to help me explore this. Um, so in a kind of still a black style, uh, do you want to give me the 10 seconds of who you are uh, and, and where you come from? We'll start with you, Dustin. Uh, I'm Dustin Benson. Oh, gosh, sorry. This is a very good mic. I'm Dustin Benson. I'm the policy director of Green Alliance, and I was uh, the chief analytical advisor on the national food strategy. Um, so very pleased to be able to be here. Uh, I'm Susan Twining. I'm the chief land use policy advisor at the Country Land and Business Association. The land use team cover everything, agriculture, forestry, and the environment. So very much looking at that integrated policy landscape. Uh, and I'm Clive Thomas. I work for the Soil Association as a senior policy advisor, uh, focusing on forestry, but in a very regenerative sense, so including agroforestry and trees in the farm landscape. Super. So the way this is going to work, we're going to kick off with a, with a presentation from Clive, really about forestry, agroforestry, and, and farming. Uh, we'll be able to have some questions after that. And then we're going to have some short presentations from Dustin and Susan on their organization's thoughts on how natural capital and farming uh, can work together. Before we dive into that, maybe just a tiny bit on who I am. I realize I haven't introduced myself. So I'm Joseph Gridley, uh, and I'm the director of Soil Association Exchange, uh, which is a new service we launched last year uh, to help any farmer in the UK to accurately measure um, the, the ecological health of their farm across things like soils, biodiversity, carbon, clean water, uh, animal welfare, and some of these social metrics as well. So that any farmer, regardless of how much money or expertise, um, can get a real sense of where you are um, so that we can help you to improve and hopefully get paid for some of that stuff in the future. Um, we're, we're early days, but as Helen said this morning, we're starting to test with 100 farms now. Uh, and many of the organizations we're working with are in this room. Um, but do come up and say hello if you want to talk on that. So without further ado, I hand over to you, Clive, uh, to take us through this great paper uh, that you've recently put together. Thanks, Joseph. Um, and it's great to be here. Nice to see everybody in the room, but also aware of all the people online. So thank you for, for joining us today. Um, as Joseph said, I'm going to um, introduce you to a piece of work that we've recently completed within the Soil Association in collaboration with Cumulus Consultants. Uh, it's actually going to be picking up on a number of themes. Um, it's going to be, uh, hopefully, there's a, there was a really good segue from the Secretary of State's um, comments earlier about how we also need to include trees and woodland uh, in our, agri uh, in our uh, land use uh, and squeeze those in somehow. Uh, and what I'd like to do is sort of introduce you to the work that we've been doing in terms of how that might be done in an agroecological agri approach. Okay, so um, hopefully it will frame the discussion for you. Um, and uh, uh, at, the heart, so at the heart of this work uh, is our contention that to achieve a farmer-led tree revolution, uh, we need to go beyond the public policy case for the benefits of integrating trees into the farming system and make both the macro and farm enterprise economic case to shift the mainstream. So we approach the work that I'm going to introduce you to uh, in two main stages. First of all, we've sought to understand the current situation for agroforestry and farm woodland. The benefits, the opportunities, the challenges and the barriers. We then moved on to develop a model that allows us to test the economic outputs from different agroforestry and farm woodland systems on, a diff on different farm types. Now the model allows us to consider the UK as a whole as well as the individual nations. And we're also able to model, uh, to vary the baseline outputs by varying performance benefits. So that's, benef that's the performance of the agricultural system or the tree system, uh, as well as public payments and carbon price. Now we intend making the model available as an open source resource when we publish the full report. 
In addition, we've used the work to inform specific country briefings, uh, and the one for England is available as a short hard copy report here at the conference today. So I will briefly introduce the key points from the scenario we modelled in a moment. But this is the report uh, that I'm referring to, and I hope the Secretary of State went away with one in his hands, uh, given the title of Trees and Woodland in the Farm Landscape, which I think is the exact phrase he used. So before I give you some insights from the model, um, what is the picture in England for this agenda currently? Well, firstly, we have a very ambitious England Tree Action Plan and some generous grants for woodland creation through the England Woodland Creation Offer. Uh, and the Environment Plan proposal for woodland cover target appears to recognise the value of trees outside woodland by proposing a composite target to increase woodland cover and tree canopy cover from the current 14.5% in England to 17.5% by 2050. Now this would be, uh, so those percentages don't sound like a lot, do they? But when you actually look at that from through the lens of the hectares that would be required, that's 420,000 hectares uh, of new woodland or woodland canopy cover over the next 28 years, which is more than 10 times the planting rate in recent times in England, even, boast, even based on the most generous assessment. So the second point is, and this is maybe a, a, another good link to some of the things that Dustin and, and Susan maybe will pick up on in the overall theme, is there's increasing interest from private finance in the potential for monetizing carbon sequestration based on agricultural land use change. This provides opportunities for farmers, but also poses risks, including distortion of land values and the ability for agriculture to achieve its own net zero responsibilities. But what about the current situation on farm? So that 2050 target for new woodland is broadly comparable to the current area of farm woodland in England, uh, which is estimated to be 385,000 hectares, which means that 30% of England's woodland cover is currently already on farm. That's one third of all private woodland in, in England. So this large resource uh, has historically been under-recognised by policymakers. It's kind of fallen through the gaps between the forestry regimes and the agricultural regimes. And for agroforestry, using our preferred definition of the deliberate integration of trees into farming systems, the problem isn't under-recognition, but just the very basic facts of a very low starting point, with only a few notable practitioners and examples in England. Now, as I say, this can be explained, I think, by in part anyway, by the 100 plus years of separation between agriculture and forestry in the UK. This regulatory, institutional, and indeed philosophical separation has had profound effects that present us with many challenges, not the least the view by many that farm forestry, whether as woodland or agroforestry systems, just isn't viable. Uh, just isn't viable. I will resist outlining the many wider challenges of this separation in the interest of time, but I will just emphasise that this unviability can be partly explained and isn't the case in many other countries. The final point on the slide there is a more positive one. I think the tide is beginning to change, uh, and we heard some of that from the Secretary of State. We do have increasing evidence for and acceptance of the policy case for integrating trees into, and woodlands into farming systems, and a proposed agroforestry standard under the Sustainable Farming Incentive by 2024 and the equivalent for on-farm woodland by 2025. At least that's our understanding. Okay, so let's consider the, that evidence base and what exactly is the case for a farmer-led approach and the development of an agroforestry and farm woodland economy. Well, we consider this against three main criteria and for all three, the evidence base appears positive. I only have time to introduce the headlines. The full report goes into more detail. First of all, there are significant co-benefits for climate and nature, as well as other ecosystem services, such as water quality and water regulation, landscape amenity, and also for animal welfare from the integration of trees and woodlands into farming systems. Secondly, agroforestry and integrated farm woodland has the potential to enhance the performance and resilience of the UK food production, as well as to improve the performance and profitability of the agricultural economy. By restructuring the landscape to one with, more, with a wider range of agricultural activities. Trees grown on farm can generate on farm substitution opportunities, 
as well as support new markets for tree-related products and services, including carbon and wider natural capital payments. Now, there's growing demand for homegrown and locally produced products generally across all sectors, and with 80% of our forest product needs imported, the prognosis for the use of more homegrown timber has to be positive. And, and finally, the third area of the uh, third criteria that looked, we looked at was the basic measure of viability, um, namely achievability. It's surely fanciful to think that more than 400,000 hectares of new woodland will be planted over the next 28 years in the crowded, contested landscapes of England through a large-scale afforestation approach based on whole farm conversion. Some of it, yes, and that would be a good thing, but all of it, surely not. So in summary, we argue that agroforestry and integrated farm woodland offers a viable and cost-effective way to enhance tree planting across England. To help illustrate our vision, we have modelled a hypothetical, but we would argue plausible scenario for England. This is briefly set out in that hard copy report that's available here at the conference today, and I hope we can make the PDF available of that online uh, to, to those of you that have joined us online. So as I say, this is a hypothetical scenario, uh, but in this one, we focused on the four farm types that dominate in England. Cereals, dairy, less favoured area grazing, and lowland grazing, with the addition of the small area of three range poultry as a fifth farm type. In the model, we used a modest allocation of a range of agroforestry and farm woodland systems to these farm types over the next 30 years, mostly allocations of one to 5% with some more ambitious proposals for 50% silver pasture for free range poultry and 10% mixed woodland for the less favoured area grazing and 10% silver pasture for dairy. Now we think the results, as I say, just based on this hypothetical scenario, are quite illuminating. Firstly, the infield agroforestry systems, namely silver arable, silver pasture and orchards with an assumed 30% canopy cover would deliver an additional 115,000 hectares by 2050. Secondly, the shelter belt and mixed farm woodland components at 100% canopy cover would deliver an additional 240,000 hectares by 2050. So cumulatively, this scenario, scenario would contrib contribute more than 85% of the proposed environment plan composite target, all without significant change in land tenure or land use change at scale. Finally, the model indicates that the change in net farm income from this scale of delivery is approximately £19 million per annum for the next 30 years, which is a small fraction of the £1.6 billion spent annually on farm support in England currently. And just to make it clear for this scenario, we didn't include any carbon payments, even for the farm woodland component, which would have been eligible under the Woodland Carbon Code. Okay, so that's a, that's a hypothetical scenario, and maybe it does give us a useful indication of the level of, of investment required to deal with the vast majority of the costs, which are actually the upfront capital investment for planting and maintaining and establishing trees and woodlands. But what else needs to change beyond the money? Firstly, we believe it's about the approach to facilitating this change. And back to that 100 years plus of separation between agriculture and forestry. Just as many of the benefits from farm forestry come from the integration between the trees and the farming system, so we need an integrated approach to implementation. This means whole farm planning that is integrated with payments, institutional support and net zero planning for agriculture. A modern day regulation that supports integrated land use and recognises, for example, that trees in the rotation or managed livestock interventions in woodlands as the regenerative practices that they can be. Secondly, we also need to build confidence in the farming community about their own capability to use their transferable skills to help lead this tree revolution. But also confidence that this isn't a flash in, a pan, flash in the pan and that, this, that the public benefits from these systems will, will, be, will be rewarded in the long term. We could do a lot worse than the public payment systems rewarding the benefits from existing farm woodland, even in their relatively poor ecological and undermanaged condition this resource will be delivering public benefits. And if these were rewarded, then maybe farmers would have confidence to plant more and manage what they have already in a more integrated way. 
Finally, the final point is we need to invest in innovation that helps to make farm forestry viable. It is in many other countries and we need a mindset shift that the, and the investment in technical development and wider innovation so that our current and future farm forestry is not written off as too small scale to be viable. I think there's a lot of parallels with what GOT was saying earlier in terms of this agenda. So just a fraction of the investment incurred by the government during the 20th century in supporting a large scale upland plantation model would help us make progress with issues of scale and supply chains for farm scale forestry practices as well as product and market development. So in summary, we contend that achieving much of our tree planting and woodland cover ambitions in England through an agroforestry and farm woodland approach with farmers in the driving seat would deliver the following key benefits. First of all, possibilities for at worst neutral impact on food production, but much more realistically, I think, as the evidence starts to build, opportunities for enhanced food production rather than displacing food production overseas or onto a smaller UK footprint. Secondly, increased farm enterprise resilience and diversification opportunities for individual farmers and the wider rural economy, including the opportunity to manage and control natural capital values within the farming system. Thirdly, those significant co-benefits for climate, nature and people. And finally, if none of those achieve policy cut through for you, far more pragmatically is the likely achievability of such an approach in the crowded contested landscapes of England compared to the alternatives of large scale afforestation based on whole farm conversion. Okay, I better wrap up there. Uh, but thanks for listening, and I'm looking forward to, the, uh, to what my fellow panellists have got to say in response, uh, as well as the discussion. Back to you, David. Perfect. Thank you very much, Clive. Uh, a really enlightening uh, presentation. Um, and in a way, it sounds, it sounds too good to be true, right? There's, there's public money coming down the line. It doesn't change the amount of food we produce. Um, there's possibility even for carbon payments, yet still the numbers of farmers doing it is really low. Uh, what do you think, you know, what, what's stopping this revolution from happening? Uh, where, where, what are the blockages still? Well, I did try to allude to that in one of the slides towards the end. So I think that it's a system, it's a whole system change that we need. Um, the money is going to help in terms of unblock some of that sort of capital investment but uh, it's, it's much more, it's a deeper um, approach that we need in terms of the overall kind of psychology, I think, of valuing the trees and the products from those trees as part of the fa farming system. So it's a, cultural, uh, it's a cultural issue, but also for us to mobilise around how we make that scale of production viable in, in a sense, in sense of supply chains and market development. Uh, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's many other things that we need to focus on. Uh, but I think we need to think about it as a whole ecosystem that we need to intervene in uh, and, and improve and develop uh, to get to where we need to get to. Well, I know, Susan, that um, you've been doing a lot of work in this area at the CLA and have gone on a recent roadshow across the country hearing what farmers have to say on this and how this all ties into natural capital. It'd be really interesting to hear, hear your thoughts and what you've been hearing out on the, out on the road. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, for those of you who don't know who the CLA are, I just thought it'd be worth just putting that in context so that you know where I'm coming from when I'm, when I'm talking. Uh, we're a membership organisation for owners of land, business and property in rural England and Wales. Um, we've got a very diverse membership. It includes very large farming operations, traditional estates, family farms, but also a high proportion of relatively small farms as well. So we have the whole spectrum. And for all, all, the vast majority, farming is an important enterprise on their farms, but they are, many of them are also diver, have diversified business interests as well. So what I just wanted to um, talk about today, um, reflect really on what Clive has been saying about the farmer-led tree revolution, because we're hearing a lot from our members about this and how that might look. Um, I think I'm going to be uh, supporting Clive in many areas, um, but there are a, a few, I think, crunchy points that need to be highlighted. And then I'm going to look at it from the other end, looking at the investor-led um, uh, drive for, na for nature and climate action. And I think there's a, there is a gap in the middle that I wanted to highlight. 
So firstly, looking at the, the trees on farms, farm and woodland, the CLA has been a long-term supporter of a more integrated approach to farming, forestry and the environment. Um, and I think probably um, might not go back as far as that 100 years of separation, but certainly um, in recent years that's been a, a primary aim. The trouble is this is not going to happen on its own. Woodland is already part of many holdings. Um, we did a survey uh, recently where over 90% of our of respondents had woodland all on their farm already, so that's established woodland. Not many of them had put in any had done any woodland creation in recent years. And interestingly, those who had, only about half of them had um, actually applied for any grants to fund that. So there was more as much tree planting for more. Uh, uh, for own purposes rather than uh, getting grants to do it. Um, it is fair to say that farm woodland is not currently thought of as an integral part of the farming system by many, many people. Um, there is some, it's often something on the side, it's something that they do something about every now and again, um, it's often ignored and it does need different management from mainstream farming activity. It, re it does require different skills and different knowledge and quite often different equipment. So it does tend to stand on its own. And I think we need to acknowledge that. We can still have it integrated in the farming system, but it is a different set of skills that are needed. So if it's to become mainstream, with improved management of existing woodland, the established woodland that's already there, and the planting of more, um, and that's uh, you know, including all the different types of farm woodland that come under the agroforestry banner or small plantations for, um, uh, or shelter belts, etc. Um, there needs to be a strong economic model, Clive mentioned that. There needs to be investment in skills and knowledge, Clive mentioned that. And I think another area that we need to do is think about collaboration. And that's part of the innovation that Clive was talking about. So the economic model, I think there are, um, there are some schemes that are targeted towards, towards farm woodland. The England Woodland Creation Offer that was launched last year is a big step with increased payments and also smaller um, individual areas that will make it more applicable to farm woodland situations. But it doesn't really, it's not very strong on low density planting. The Sustainable Farming Incentive Agroforestry Standard that the Secretary of State mentioned will be in, is going to be in development shortly, but we still to see what that will actually produce and how that will support agroforestry. But it's clear that there is a will there to include agroforestry in more mainstream activities. My fear is that these two actions will help but um, it will help those who are already positive about woodland. It won't necessarily be enough to overcome the barriers and inertia for the majority on their own. So we also need to have, um, in order to get this mainstreaming of farm woodland, we need to get land managers and advisors, and not just woodland advisors, this is business advisors, who have access to good, independent, robust, and uh, honest information about farm woodland. Farm woodland is not going to be for everyone. Secondly, I think farm woodland will still be a relatively small part of many holdings. So this is where the collaboration comes in, development of services that support that farm woodland. So being able to collaborate with neighbours to, to, to provide services for advice or for machinery and equipment that come in and do the management is absolutely crucial. And I think incentives for collaboration will, would be a game changer in that place, in that area. So I'm now going to just look at uh, the other end of the telescope and looking at one, one of the issues of small woodland or relatively small areas of woodland on farm is that they often fly under the, the barrier, the, 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 uh, the, um, the, area, the area required to really make use of um, carbon codes, carbon payments. So looking at it from the investor set end of the market is a very different lens. So we know that um, the, 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 um, the Green Finance Institute recently published a report showing that in England there's a £21 billion funding gap for nature and climate over the next 10 years to meet the targets set by government. So the private sector environmental markets is going to be absolutely crucial to plug that gap. But it will need in, in long-term funding from government as well as the ongoing charity and um, private sector markets to take play, to take, play their part. So these private sector markets, they, there's a real um, uh, 
real problem in some respects. A lot of the focus is on the scale. The private sector investment that's coming through often wants to invest at scale. That's what they're looking for. There's no projects that are big enough to, to interest a lot of the investor end. So the real challenge is to be able to find ways that smaller woodland can then and other nature projects can actually become part of this private sector funding. There are potential multiple wins, obviously, with the private sector markets. Farmers get a new set, of, a new income stream. Businesses can help to meet the regulation and voluntary commitments. Communities get local employment opportunities, and the government is uh, on target to meet their uh, on track to meet their targets. So, what there are some big opportunities there, but the problem is that there are also some risks for the individual farming particularly for the individual farming-based projects that will be squeezed out due to their lack of scale. There's also uncertainty about the new government schemes and the compatibility and the pricing with these private sector markets. And the whole future of farming means that the land managers are currently in a, a bit of a state of uh, frozen moment about how to, um, what, what, what to do, how can they make informed choices when there's so many uncertainties out there. So to start unlocking all this, there are some actions that we think that government will need to make. The first one is leading in development of independent standards that ensure that these private sector markets continue to be high integrity. We don't want any charges of greenwashing, either from landowner or from the investor's point of view. Um, we need certainty around the, the issues of additionality, stacking and blended finance. How is all that going to be work, going to work? There needs to be support for development of collaborative projects um, and how, that can, how they can be made larger and uh, accessible to all different types of farmers and all sizes of farmers. We need to develop private sector funding mechanisms that help to scale these, help to manage these projects at scale, local projects at scale. And then, crucially, an update of the tax treatment for land managers, which is currently a barrier to some of the larger scale projects that might come through from the, the farming sector. And finally, capacity building in expertise in nature-based solutions. There's a lot of people, and perhaps some, and many in the room now, there are a lot of people that are involved in this, but there's still, there still needs to be a lot more expertise out there to really get this happening at scale. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Super. Um, I think really, really a sweet <laughs> I think that's the kind of the, yeah, that these are the two sides that kind of come out of this debate quite a lot. That on the one hand, maybe natural capital is this panacea that, you know, makes farming really profitable again. And on the other hand, is all these fears that it doesn't get to the small farmer, that there's corporate land grabs and, you know, there's articles every week about this happening in Wales at the moment, um, that the rules of this actually doing anything good for climate and nature won't be there. And I know this is something that you guys at Green Alliance have done a lot of work on. Uh, in the two papers you had at the Oxford Farming Conference this year, I feel, yeah, you went into these in a, in a huge amount of detail. It'd be great to think where, where your thinking is currently. Thanks very much. Um, gosh, it's, it's a challenge to go last because lots of clever people have said clever things. Um, maybe I'll just pull back for a second and, and remind us of the kind of natural capital goals which are out there and then take you through a bit of a thought experiment about how we might achieve those goals with private money, depending upon how we govern it. Because I think my key message is, we've got a lot of choice about whether we end up with loads of farm woodland or whether we end up with loads of land grabs. It's fundamentally a democratic decision, which we'll, we will make by setting up markets and setting up rules and whatnot. And I'll just describe what two different systems might look like. So our big goals are a quarter less emissions overall from the um, land system by 2030, 30% less methane, a halt in species decline, which is an absolutely extraordinary target, and we should all be applauding, but it's a, it's a big deal, and setting aside 30% of land in some way on and off farm for nature. These are big changes, right? These are really significant ones, and I don't want to, anyone to lose the radicalness of the targets that uh, George Eustace has, has signed up to. The, the upside is that to achieve those targets, in principle, there is also big money. So when we quantified the amount of private capital money, that, or private money that might come into the carbon market, and we chose carbon bluntly because it's really easy, nature is a nightmare to value, we reckon there is about £1.7 billion worth of private money that could come into the land system from carbon payments. That's a big deal, and that is potentially profit to farmers if we govern the system well. 
might be profit to big, uh, you know, landowners who are uh, buying new land. So that, that's the that's the potential risk. So I want to come back to the, the sort of the three compartment model that uh, the National Food Strategy came out with, because I think it helps us to think about how private capital might play in the natural capital market. I'll start with the easy one, and that is the kind of very low intensity, probably you want to focus mainly on nature compartment and talk about how, to, how natural capital payments might lead a, a kind of paradigmatic upland sheep farm uh, to change over the next, say, decade. So just to put this in your mind, this is a, this is a lower income upland sheep farm. Uh, if you look at the stats, um, these are farms that um, depend on basic payments and sometimes countryside stewardship scheme money to survive. Uh, the lower half of uh, the average upland farm uh, in performance terms hasn't made money on farming in about 50 years. Um, we have designed the system to take people who are extraordinarily hardworking and give them terrible incomes. And I think that private capital and public commitments for, for nature could be the route to giving people a decent livelihood in these places. So let me give you the kind of what happens if we design a carbon market that is principally focused on least cost carbon sequestration. And this is what markets do. They optimize for cost, they strip out the detail, and they give you incredible efficiency, but with a cost. So in that paradigmatic upland sheep farm, paying perhaps between four and 10 pounds per ton of CO2, it's cost effective to stop farming entirely, plant a big mixed conifer woodland, um, come away with the same income. Actually, I suspect you'd be able to do better than that. Um, carbon prices in the woodland carbon code are above that, so you would actually make a decent income. And if you imagine you're 70 years old and you've put in, you know, probably 55 years of hard labor on that farm, you might be thinking, well, carbon payments will give me an income for my retirement and my kids will get a woodland, which is a commercial woodland, with a timber crop, uh, and that's their inheritance. So this is actually potentially a good deal. And that, I think, is where the sector will go. Whole farm, large scale, single business model, quite simple, rides entirely on the carbon payment. But of course, that's wholesale land use change, and there's not much nature in even a reasonably well-managed Sitka plantation. So let's imagine what we could do with that if we integrated our goals, if we wanted nature and climate and decent livelihoods as well. We did some work in the food strategy, which um, is still in the kind of kitty of all the stuff that didn't quite make, the, uh, make it off the cutting room floor, about what a conservation woodland might look, look like. So same starting farm, poor soil, not cost effective to, to farm sheep. At a price of about 75 pounds per ton of carbon, you could plant a new broadleaf native woodland. Uh, you get all the nature that comes with that for free. Uh, you'd get a good income out of that because the carbon payments are high enough to give the farmer a, a decent livelihood. Um, and this is the, the, the kind of negative from a farming perspective. You have to have a lot fewer sheep. We estimate you might get 10% of your original flock. You could graze them in the woodland, though, over time, particularly once the trees have got tall enough that the sheep don't eat them, which is uh, the principal problem. That's actually pretty cost effective. 75 pounds a ton is what we pay today for carbon emissions uh, in, you know, steelworks or, or fossil fuel production and whatnot. The difference between these two things basically is how we govern the system. You'd never choose to make that woodland if you went for a cost-optimized, carbon-focused, single market only, where you were just trying to say, what is the most cost-effective per ton of carbon thing we want to do? You could still have that market, but you'd need on top of it an ELM system and a private market for biodiversity payments that could be easily stacked to provide uh, income for the farmer on biodiversity, on the wood itself, uh, on nature, and of course on, on carbon. And that's the choice that we have in policy terms. Do we want all of that ladder farm, and we will need productive woodland, or do we want some of that conservation woodland? And that's in the kind of, you know, the extreme scenario, which is easy to paint. I think that if you look at the food strategy, we, we said you might want to do that on between 5 and 10% of the land. So this is a small share of the total land system. The other big compartment, the compartment that you'd want to see doing lower intensity, much more nature-friendly farming, you can imagine the same sets of outcomes, except it's really hard because that farmer needs to integrate cost of carbon into their calculations, potential biodiversity credits, how that new woodland on a farm integrates with their livestock. So I'm seeing some lovely happy sheep, uh, probably not being too hot in a nice English summer. Uh, you need to monetize the benefits of that for animal uh, well, uh, health and welfare. You need to think about what that does to 
for example, milk production or, or meat production. This is really hard stuff. And the challenge I think we have is that it's easy to grow a plantation forest. It's relatively easy to grow a conservation woodland. And you know, your product is either, in the first case, just carbon, or in the second case, carbon in nature. That latter model, the model of which I think should be the dominant model in terms of land use, involves an extraordinary range of skills. Uh, and it also in involves an extraordinary range of um, payment mechanisms. So I guess my, my final point, which I'll finish on, is that we, should, we need to decide whether we want to put the onus of doing that onto the individual farm entrepreneur. Do we want a, you know, the majority of England's farmers to be incredibly effective at understanding all the different contract lengths and all the different kind of markets and doing the integration themselves? Or do we want to design a policy that makes that a lot easier? Because if we don't, by accident, we will probably end up doing the easy option, which will be lots of lovely woodland in the uplands on low quality soils, which we definitely want, but not much else. And that would be a huge missed opportunity. Great. We've got lots of questions coming in, so do keep them coming in through the, through the mentee. Um, and now we're going to open up into a bit of a, a, bit of a discussion. So... Susan, maybe, you know, having heard all of, these, all of these points, what would be your predictions? You know, in, in 20 years' time, uh, are, we, are we seeing a farmer that's, you know, selling milk and wheat and carrots, but also has a product line of carbon and biodiversity? Or is this pie-in-the-sky thinking? Uh, I really don't know. Um, I think what we'll find is that it'll be a bit of everything. Um, you know, we've got quite a... A large range of agroclimatic regions in the in the UK that have got different farming types, different specialisations. I think the changes will be different depending on what the current use is now. Um, there, there is already a move to more integrated farming for some, um, and I think that that will probably increase. But I think there will still be room. I mean, I think it may be the you know, the three compartment model. Uh, it, it does make sense to a lot of people. Not everybody likes the idea that they have to, um, you know, that, that the optimum land use for their, their particular farm is to have some, you know, have some um, environmental land management, depending on their own ambitions and their uh, objectives for their business. It may be to farm, uh, sustainable farm, high output sustainable farming, and that may well be, that will be part of the mix, and that might be regionally differentiated. Um, it's, it's a really diffi difficult picture. I think at the moment, because there's so many different opportunities, but none of them are really very clear, uh, it's trying to ask anybody, you know, if we were to ask our members, what are they going to be doing? What do they see themselves in 10, 20 years' time? I don't think any of them would be able to answer it clearly or honestly. So it's uh, up for grabs still. It's definitely something we're hearing too. It's kind of, we know this is coming. We know it's important. Um, but there's not enough clarity for you to really be able to, 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 to plan a route of action. Um, a lot of questions coming in, Clive, around um, the differences in the report you wrote for kind of those who own their farms and those that are tenants on farms. How do you think that will play out uh, as we move to putting more and more trees on, 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 on farms? Um, I mean, I, I think the stats are about 30%, is it, tenant farming in, in England? So, yeah, do recognise that as a significant barrier. Um, it's really interesting when you hear one of the leading advocates of somebody who is a tenant farmer who's done some of this already, uh, Stephen Briggs, one of the reasons that he opted for fruit trees in his agroforestry system was to get that early return within his tenancy. So I think we, I think there's others working on this for a wider set of reasons as well. I think we need to see, um, you know, reform effectively in the tenancy um, approach to how some of this longer term benefit both to the natural capital of the individual farm, uh, but also the current tenant farmer uh, is taken forward into the future. I don't have a silver bullet, but it's definitely part of that system that needs to change. I know you guys did a lot of work on, on ownership of kind of natural capital assets. And I think this is, it's interesting because it plays out in the kind of landlord tenant, but it also plays out in the, who's buying the carbon credits. Is it the farmer who gets to keep it, the processor, the retailer? Everyone wants a slice of this so they can drop their scope three, scope two, scope one emissions. And how, how do you divide up this cake when everyone ultimately wants to kind of eat the same thing? 
<laughs> a, a cakeist metaphor is uh, appropriate for our times, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess you need to have an idea of what you want your reform to be and how natural capital payments go into that. One of my biggest fears, and I will come to your question, but I want to touch on the point which has been raised before about delay. You know, you, you said before we're in a frozen moment. I remember when Michael Gove said we're now in an unfrozen moment, and I want to be in that unfrozen moment again because we got to get moving, right? Like two years, to, two years of extra delay to Elm halves the uh, carbon savings from the policy. That was some analysis we, we put out last week. We don't have time, you know? It's eight years till our 2030 targets to halt species decline. We got to move, right? And that's my message to, to DEFRA, but it's also my message to, to everyone here. To answer your question about this, uh, you know, who, who gets the carbon credits? First thing to say is carbon credits are probably a good thing because they separate the carbon from the ownership of the land. And if you aren't able to do that, the only way you can own the natural capital is by buying land. That's what you're seeing right now. So all the stories that you see in Wales about you know, big companies coming in and buying up new land, there's no way of them getting at the carbon without buying the land. So they're just buying the land and they're taking the, uh, you know, the, the idea that they'll be able to monetize that carbon in, in the future. If I were a farmer and I thought, I've got a business model that's going to support me in farming for some time. I don't want to take the option of doing something different. And I, I think we shouldn't frown on that. There's a, definitely a role for people stepping away from conventional farming and moving to something that's very radically different, either the kind of wild farming I described, conservation woodland stuff, or something that's a bit more intermediate. But let's say you want to, to remain a farmer. I think on carbon grounds, you'll want to be selling net zero carbon produce and that probably means that you want to work with your supply chain to work out how your carbon sequestration on your land can contribute to their scope three decarbonization goals. So just to make it really simple, if you're selling, I don't know, uh, pigs to Tesco or something like that, you want to monetize, capture, and increase all the carbon sequestration that your land can provide, thinking also about the downstream emissions associated with, for example, soy production in the Amazon, just picking up my WWF colleagues who are smiling at me in the audience, and pitch your farm as, I have captured as much carbon as my pig farm produces, I can sell you a net zero carbon product, and you should preference me over your supplier. If you can do that and you have some surplus, then goodness, take that as farm income and bring that in, into your business as, as extra income, extra diversification. But that would be my advice to, to farmers. Nice. Yeah, it's something that hearing more and more, this kind of preference to, to insects, so the, the farmer still kind of is in control, I guess, of their, of their natural capital. And if they've got some left at the end, uh, then, then maybe they can get an extra, an extra bit of income too. Because then you're in charge, right? If, you, if you've sold your carbon early, then you, know, you, you, you can't monetize it. You can't compete with another producer who's come along and said, well, I've got zero carbon, you know, whatever, broad beans or something like that. Your broad beans are a very good crop. We should be growing more of them. And for you, Susan, you know, there's a, I guess there's two routes this could go. There's people further up the, the food supply chain could say, well, this is just a sanitary factor. You, you, if you want to sell to us as supermarket X, you need to be net zero, you need to be biodiversity net positive. Um, and that's just the rule, and if you want to sell to them, that's what you need. Or they help you on that transition by paying for some of these scope three insects and up kicks in biodiversity. Um, what, what are you hearing on this? You know, what, what would be your message, I guess, to, to those that are buying this stuff, how they can start to stitch this into some of their contracts, the way they work with farmers? I, mean, I, th I think there's... I mean, it's a hugely complex subject, which I think we have established. Um, I think one of the many of the actions for reducing your climate, um, your emissions from farming, are actually win-wins. So I think do those first. You know, make sure you do those first. And then I think from the res you know, where you've got residual emissions, it is about working with that supply chain. I think there's a responsibility with the supply chains. And they're taking their responsibilities seriously about their scope three emissions. And look, and we've, you know, this this isn't new. This has been going on for some time. There's many of the big brands have been working with their suppliers for a long time um, to help reduce emissions. I think there's a there is a bit of a challenge, and um, it's usually not a very popular one. But I'm going to do it anyway. That uh, the, the committee on climate change are not expecting agriculture to be net zero, and so I think th this can't be uh, th this can't be a fudge. I think we need to be considering the industry as a whole over the long term, making it as, as, uh, as uh, efficient as possible in terms of carbon. Um, 
and not over obsessing about products that, sorry Dustin, but not over obsessing about products that are net zero. Now I, I can see that it would give you a, an advantage in the marketplace, but I think there are problems with that. Farm boundaries are fairly arbitrary. You know, they're not necessarily designed for being net zero. So you may not be able to, tenant farmers may not be able to take the actions required to become net zero. So I think it's dangerous ground to be getting into around net zero products at this stage. Down the line, we can look at it differently, but at this stage, it's dangerous. Mm. Do, 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 you want to, do you want to repost? Yeah, let's yeah, have a repost. <laughs> if you look at the CCC scenarios, you end up with a, you've got a bit of the system that doesn't decarbonize, and then you've got a bit of the system that hoovers Sorry, up the emissions. Sorry, sure. I can never tell quite where I should be because I feel like I'm shouting at you if I get too close. Um, in the CCC scenarios, you have a set of residual emissions, so stuff that doesn't get to zero, and then a set of, of negative emissions, slightly funny way of putting it, carbon sequestration. 60% of the residual emissions in the CCC's mainstream scenario come from the land system itself. It's degrading peat uh, and it's ruminants, basically. So the reason why I talked about insetting is that if farmers take control of that, they're in charge. I mean, farmers control 70% of the land in, in, in the UK. So maybe not on an individual farm. That's a good point because you, you might not have a, a farm that can sequester a lot of carbon. Um, but it makes a lot of sense to inset that. The fear I have with an early sale to other sectors is that the big second sector for residual emissions is the aviation industry. That's about a quarter of the total residual emissions. And the aviation industry has a lot of money. So if I were thinking in a kind of evil sort of how do I turn carbon markets to, to in a nasty kind of way, I'd hoover up all those cheap natural carbon sequestration options and I'd sell them to BA or pick your airline of choice, not a, not a diatribe against them, uh, and say, oh, well, we've, uh, we've now got uh, net zero flying. Um, and guess what, farmers? Uh, you've got a real problem because you've sold all your carbon. So that's the message behind, you know, take control of your carbon. Try to produce net zero products if you can. If you can't, maybe contract with another farmer who's got a bit of spare capacity on their land. But that's the, I think the future is that net zero um, produce. Sorry to disagree. Yeah, and this is something we do here, right? Quite a lot uh, out talking to farmers that they feel like they've been backed into a corner anyway and have been labeled as, you know, people damaging the climate. And that if they move too quickly uh, to sell their carbon, then in 10 years' time, they can still be labeled as the people that are damaging the carbon, where somehow an airline industry gets off scot-free because on the, the official balance, uh, they've become higher whilst the other has become lower. Um, this really is the most complex kind of topic in the world. Uh, we could sit here for days discussing it, uh, but you'd all be bored. Um, so we're going we're gonna to wrap things up. And, you know, I think the main thing in this is the utility of these conversations for helping farming go on a transition to be more profitable and more sustainable. And so I wonder if we could just go from Clive back up this way, just to, you know, if you're a farmer today, trying to get your head around this stuff, what, what advice would you give them? Um, what kind of tips and tricks to start to engage in this world uh, in a way that doesn't, you know, trap them in the future? Okay, well, I think that question does allow me to make one of the final points I wanted to make, which is about how to view the carbon. So... I think if I was lucky enough to be a farmer, um, then um, I would be focusing on what is the real evidence in terms of trees in your farming system to improve your productivity. So some of the things you're already trying to do, either as a livestock farmer uh, or as an arable farmer, uh, and how can more of, the, more of, the, more of those trees maybe um, benefit you even more in the future? Now, carbon might well be the catalyst for you to get into that headspace and get, get thinking in that way in terms of that additional payment. But ultimately, I think, you know, for this to be successful and resilient and sustainable in the long run, because we're supposed to be solving climate change by 2050, um, this needs to stack up in its own right in terms of the productivity of the land uh, and the productivity from the trees on the, on, in that, as part of that system. So it's a, it's a much wider set of products and services, I think, from the trees and the farming system that we need to be focusing on. And that's what I'd be focusing on as a farmer. Great advice and a nice pressy for what's coming after lunch as well. Uh, so thank you. Uh, Susan. Um, well, I think the first thing is that every farm is different. Um, so this solution is going to be different for every farm. So it really is about looking at your own resources, looking at the land availability, the type of land, your ambitions, your personal objectives, 
um, and then looking at what the opportunities are around uh, nature and climate, um, but also taking a, a, a very judicious look at it because it's this is there's some short term things that can be done without risk, relatively low risk, and that tends to be the government schemes. So countryside stewardship, looking at sustainable farming incentive, they're they're almost uh, you know fairly straightforward decisions to be making in the short term. I think the choices when you start you know, looking longer ahead, there could be biodiversity net gain, there could be uh, carbon markets, um, a whole range of different carbon markets, not just un under the Woodland Carbon Code. And I think keeping options open at this stage has got to be what it is. But having that long-term thinking, start to learn about these markets now. They're fiendishly complicated. You know, we've got some guidance notes on them that um, have taken us months to, to develop, really. And they're still, we're updating them regularly because there's new thinking, new information, new language. The language hasn't settled yet. So I think my advice now would be to start making, um, making informing yourself informing yourselves about what these markets are going to look like and then being in a position to act quickly when it's right for you. Great advice. And Dustin, to wrap us off. Um, I, look, I work for a think tank, so I think politics. Uh, I guess my advice to, uh, to farmers would be to write to George Eustace um, and ask him to, to do two things. Uh, firstly, set out a rural land use framework. And I just want to be clear, that's not a top-down command and control thing. Uh, the, the best way of, of conceiving of it I can think of is to quote Hannah Arendt, uh, more than advice, but less than command. The idea is we, we know that, lots, that natural capital is unevenly distributed. We know where it is. We know you, where you'd want to most protect for nature and for carbon. And we know where land is most suited to producing food. Sharing that information so that individual landowners can make their own decisions. And there is going to be a huge amount of heterogeneity. There are some upland sheep farms that make tons of money, really well managed, really very cost effective, particularly when they are in a direct sales kind of relationship. This isn't a, there will be a block of northern England that is just covered in trees for primeval woodland. I, I cannot see that happening. Um, that, but that information and a bit of steer from central government begins to unfreeze the frozen moment we've got us into. And the second is to bring forward some of the more exciting schemes within ELM, particularly local nature recovery. That's going to give you much more money for the nature that you can find on your farm than the existing SFI schemes or even the ones that are promised. So I think that is the sweet spot for farmers who want to monetize the value of nature, monetize the value of, car of carbon in these kind of mixed farm woodlands plus a farm enterprise kind of businesses. Super. So there you have it. Figure out how nature and trees can make your business more resilient. Do your research, figure out, you know, get the science reviewed, uh, make sure you're reading the right stuff for your farm. And write to George Eustace. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to all my panelists. Uh, and now it's time for lunch.